Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Boston. Okay. My name is Peter Pouliot. I work for Microsoft, and I uh, work on the OpenStack integration of Microsoft technologies and the larger OpenStack ecosystem. And I'm here today with my colleague and friend, Alessandro Pilotti of Cloud-Based Solutions. Yep. <laughs> and we're here to discuss the uh, latest and greatest for this release cycle uh, for the Windows platform and OpenStack. Okay. All right. So we will start with killing these things here. <laughs> A minute. Just a second. This is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We try to look good at all times. Anyway, a little bit of history. You this is actually, uh, I'll take over a little bit. A little bit of history, uh, the OpenStack on Windows project is pretty much run here out of Boston. Uh, our continuous integration infrastructure for all the Microsoft technologies is a, roughly about, what, five, six blocks over the river that way. So uh, yeah, this is our home, and you know, welcome for being here. Uh, my first uh, OpenStack summit was Boston, uh, the original. Boston Summit. So we've been uh, working to bring uh, Windows technologies into the forefront of OpenStack for quite some time. Um, and if my friend Alessandro here can ever, <laughs> there we go, all right. Okay, uh, let's resume the slides. Okay, here we go. All right, so our goal from the get-go has always been to ensure that uh, Windows is a first-class citizen uh, both as a guest and as a functional component in OpenStack. And uh, you know, what we're here to do and sort of prove to you today is that uh, you know, Windows is actually a first class citizen and there's really no difference in managing your Windows instances in OpenStack as there is to managing uh, your Linux instances. So and our, our goal, as I said, has always been to uh, make sure that your OpenStack experience with Windows is an OpenStack experience. Um, so we tend to plug in seamlessly with all the uh, necessary um, sort of layers that one would and practices that one would um, typically use for managing their OpenStack infrastructure. Yeah. Now, who are we? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'll okay. Go. So how many of you guys are running Windows instances in OpenStack today? Yay, cool. Yay, all right. Okay. And how many of you are using Cloud-based init? Good. Okay. So Cloud-based init is the de facto standard today in, uh, in deploying Windows instances in OpenStack, okay? Um, it's modeled conceptually, let's say, like Cloud init for, for Linux. So the main idea here is to make sure that when people deploy an experience, let's say, the usage of a, a Windows instances in an OpenStack context, they have a very familiar uh, framework, okay? So it has to be something that is not something completely independent that somehow fits, you know, badly inside of a completely different type of framework, but it's something that has to be very natural, both coming from, a, from an OpenStack direction, so from, for example, Linux experience for cloud need and everything, and also from a, from a Windows direction, so coming from a, a type of a Windows, uh, Windows Server oriented sysadmin model, no? And that's, that's how actually we wrote cloud based init. It's fully Python code. So it fully looks and feels like, uh, like, like an OpenStack project, basically, from that perspective. Um, it's wrapped in a Windows service. So if you are a Windows sysadmin, you will just be able to, to see it as a, normal, as a normal service. It works on any supported Windows version, including Nano Server. It has a very uh, extendable model based on our own plugins and supports basically every possible cloud. Uh, OpenStack is, of course, the main one, EC2. Um, Azure, Azure Stack, uh, Cloud Stack, Open Nebula, MAS, uh, GC, Oracle Cloud, and so on, okay? So the main idea is that you could even create a single image and run it on every cloud, and Cloud Business will take care of everything for you. Here is a very limited list of the things that Cloud Business can do for you, okay? A lot of those things are new from, from the Otaka, Okata uh, lifecycle, and, uh, and of course also um, extending into the Pike one. So what, what can you do? Setting host name, uh, creating uh, username and passwords, managing, of course, your admin password, 
uh, setting static networking, uh, even on Ironic, for example, to connect to the previous session. Managing public keys, uh, automatic volume expansion, you know, when you boot different flavors. Uh, um, configuring the HTTP listeners, configuring the time service, automatic updates, SAM policy, licensing. So, for example, you can uh, move your VM from prem to cloud, okay, and get, and get already your licensing configured if something that, that you need, okay. Uh, setting NTP services, setting the right MTU for OpenVSwitch, switch, and of course running every type of user data script that you might need, you know. Um, more details, there is a full documentation on the link that you can see there, okay. So this is just like scratching the surface of what Cloud, cloud Business Need can do for you. How do we ensure uh, that testing works? Uh, testing is fully based on a continuous integration framework based on Tempest, which is uh, based on Argos and Arrestor, which are names coming from the Greek mythology, um, that we use to test cloud based needs on every possible um, Windows version. So I imagine when you have uh, to test the, every single patch that comes in on Windows 7, 8, 8, 1, and 10 twice because it's x86 and 64. And then again, Windows Server 2008, 2008 R2, 12, 2012 R2, 2016, and even Nano Server, which has a completely different, you know, uh, surface from this perspective. So these are actually the tools that we, we run, which, which we run also as part of the Cambridge uh, facility, right, Peter? Yep. So yeah, as, as uh, Alexandro said, uh, we take the approach of basically scientifically proving the value of the work that we do through our testing. Right, so uh, we assure you that this is all extremely high quality, these aren't toys, this is all enterprise worthy and worthy of being consumed in your OpenStack uh, deployment uh, to make sure that your Windows instances operate as uh, sort of best as they possibly can. And as Alessandro said, we try to do that for every uh, supported release of Windows that Microsoft currently has available okay. today. So. Before you ask, yes, it runs also on Windows XP in 2003, and no, we don't support XP in 2003. <laughs> so if you want to run it, it works. Uh, we provide it, let's say, as consulting services, but we don't have intention to support this as an upstream feature for the simple reason that it's also not supported by Microsoft. Right? Um, out of those projects, for example, Arrestor, which is the uh, project which simulates all the possible uh, cloud metadata um, um, Interf API interfaces, that's new actually in the last in the last cycle, okay? It's all, of course, open source and all available on, uh, on, on GitHub. Uh, this is all news here. There is a, a Windows Server OpenStack evaluation image, right, Peter? Yep, that's currently available for OpenStack testing only. Uh, we were able to get a uh, special license out of our legal team to allow for that. So I give you, uh, please take it, try it, test it out. Uh, in your OpenStack environment if you want, prior to uh, baking and rolling your own images. Okay. Um, you might be curious to know how many people are actually using cloud based in it, you know? And of course, like with every open source project, it's quite difficult to determine the real usage, okay? So we have some basic statistics, basic on downloads, update requests, and everything. And I can tell you that since we started checking, let's say, that the amount of instances and cloud based in it runs that we, we were collecting, uh, from late 2015 till today, there are 8 million of them, okay? So, so whoever is telling you that OpenStack is not, uh, is not real or is not really getting into enterprise, and to people which are saying that OpenStack is not really Windows friendly, well, 8 million instances to me seems quite a big number, right? <laughs> and once again, he did say since uh, mid last year. Yeah, so, so it's quite huge. Um, how to build Windows images? This is also something that you know, everybody's always asking. Uh, and again, Windows instances that can run on every possible hypervisor, right? Not only on Hyper-V. Uh, most people, of course, ask about KVM, which is, of course, the most popular platform for, for OpenStack, but it works also on VMware, on Xen Server, and so on. So here are a bunch of tools that we keep on updating. There are, of course, a lot of updates in the last cycle even there. There is support for nano server and so on. Again, okay, it's slightly different repository, but let's say this is the main one. Um, and you can basically run tools that will generate the images for you. Basically, they generate an offline Windows image, and then they run it in a Windows machine to apply all the Windows updates, okay? Plus additional scripts that you might have. It includes Virtual.io or uh, VMware tools or whatever drivers you need, Windows updates, custom drivers, custom applications, and so on. 
Another very common question is uh, how do you run custom user data? You can run PowerShell, uh, basically CMD, meaning old school, you know, common prompt, uh, batch files, uh, bash, or Python. Um, in order to determine the content of your user data, it's very simple. The first line will start with um, pound PS1, okay, she PS1. That's pretty similar to the model that you might be familiar with, uh, with, of course, with Linux, right? So actually, if it starts with a typical shebang, then we know that it's, it's a bash script, okay? Um, we also support the, uh, the syntax that the EC2 folks use, which is simply a PowerShell tag and then the scripts and end, okay? So both of them are supported, meaning that you can have the same identical user data script working on Amazon EC2 and also on cloud-based init. Here are just two very simple examples of things you can do, you know, just creating users, uh, assigning local groups, uh, domain joins, and stuff like that. If, you get, if it gets more complex, of course, you can run everything inside of a user data script, and I, of course, you have only the limitation of the, of, the, of the size of the user data that you can have in, the, in, the, in metadata, but of course, we accept also gzipped metadata, so this means that it's fairly unlimited, the amount of data that you can run. But if you're serious about, <laughs> let's say, orchestration, I would strongly recommend to use something like heat templates, Juju, or whatever, okay? So here there are some uh, good examples about how to create an Active Directory controller. They are all upstream. I think I can even open it here. So let's see if I can even go here. So you see that there is the typical YAML file on a heat template. So here are the other resources about how to, you know, create a, a, com a computer resource and so on. And at the bottom, you will find also the, the scripts that are being executed. So, let me see if I can get it back, okay. And here, you have um, a PSM1, so a PowerShell module, and you have also a, a script that will perform actually the, the, the actual configuration is here. We are importing the module, and we are simply saying, hey, install Active Directory Domain Controller, and performing the rest of the operations that we need to do. No? And here there is a bunch of PowerShell that will show you how to, no, sorry, the other one. There you go. And here there is a bunch of PowerShell that will show you how to, how to actually perform the work, no? and how to synchronize with, with the remaining um, system. Okay, let's go back to the templates. There is another example for SQL Server, but you know, at that point you can do really whatever you want there. So we get a lot of questions around Windows licensing in OpenStack, and you know, it's basically the same as licensing any other Windows instance, right, uh, in your environment. Um, we typically you know, recommend people, if they're gonna be deploying Windows Server as a, uh, you know, as a, as a component, of the underlying OpenStack infrastructure that you use uh, data center licensing. And in fact, it's probably your best uh, solution in all cases. And if you're gonna be hosting uh, other people's content on uh, Windows Server, then you will need the SPLA uh, licensing set. Um, you know, obviously this works regardless of, you know, the Windows licensing is really kind of regardless of um, hypervisor. And it can be extremely cost effective when, use, when choosing, once again, the, the right licensing model for your deployment, um, such as like, you know, whether you're a volume license customer or SPLA customer. Now, you know, we also get questions, does Microsoft support you know, Windows uh, or, or OpenStack and Windows? And well, the reality of the situation is that Microsoft uh, will support Windows guests when they run on Hyper-V specifically, or they support Windows guests when they're using a certified VertIO driver stack, which today, in order to get a certified VertIO driver stack, you have to be using an enterprise Linux from one of the vendors you see on that list. And you will get that driver stack directly from that vendor, okay? It is not the Fedora VertIO driver stack that you are uh, probably familiar with uh, that's available for free. That, uh, if you decide to use that Fedora driver stack in your Windows instance, you essentially render that Windows instance unsupportable from a Microsoft legalese perspective. How many of you guys are using the Virtual.io upstream drivers? Okay. So they work perfectly fine. The only issue, remember, is that Microsoft won't support them. Okay, so that's the, 
That's the only thing to remember. Of course, with Hyper-V, you don't have that limitation, meaning that the stack is anyway supported. But the alternative is to go with, as Peter was saying, with somebody and Once again, if you're already paying a customer support subscription for your Linux, Linux distribution, you might already have access to those drivers already. So now, uh, you know, what happens if, if you need help directly from Microsoft? Well, you can reach out to our team, our OpenStack team at Microsoft, right, by emailing OpenStack at Microsoft.com. And that will come, you know, directly to myself and uh, other individuals on, the, on our team, and we can try to direct you in the best uh, possible way uh, to get your assistance. Okay. Now let's move to the house side of things. So OpenStack plus Hyper-V, we, we've come, let's say, a pretty long way around that. We started in Folsom, right, Peter, for that. And, uh, and uh, well, we did well, actually, quite a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> we, it started yeah. a little longer before that, yeah. but uh, essentially since 2010, uh, there's been a Hyper-V driver. Yeah. So shortly after the original release of OpenStack. Um, we, the current iteration, as Alzheimer has said, has been since 2012. Yeah. All right, um, some unique Hyper-V plus OpenStack features. So just to make it clear, you can run Windows guests perfectly fine in OpenStack on KVM, okay? There are, of course, some advantages on using Hyper-V as, as a hypervisor. Now, we live in a world in which hypervisors, are, of course, nowadays are very commoditized. So it's not that it's the end of the world <laughs> if you're not using Hyper-V and use KVM for, for you running a, a Windows guest. Actually, as, as Peter was saying before, uh, they are perfectly supported. Um, but, but there are some specific advantages that you may find useful for, for Windows. No? So one of them is Windows failover clustering. So uh, people are using ask, uh, asking, hey, what can I do with my uh, virtual machines, which are leveraged, for example, um, any time of host level high availability, okay, like VMware vMotion or, or Windows Server um, um, failover clustering, and, and they want to move them to, to OpenStack, which traditionally is a platform more oriented you know, at uh, cattle compared to pets. No? And uh, the good thing is that we have also a driver for the Windows failover clustering, okay? So hopefully we'll be able to demo it to you pretty soon. Plus we have remote effects. So if you're running VDI workloads, that's definitely the right thing to do. And there is a new feature, again, okay, at a time frame, which is shielded VMs that basically allows you to do uh, full VM encryption and isolation and also having a um, completely in independent uh, security model, to say so, from the underlying host. So even if somebody takes control of the underlying host, your VMs will anyway be safe, okay? There is quite a lot to discuss about this topic, so we wouldn't be able to, to, to introduce it only in a, in a short session like this one. But uh, please feel free to come to our booth or to ask at uh, OpenStack at Microsoft.com, as, um, as um, Peter was mentioning. And, and, and trust me that that's a, a feature that really changes the way in which you can consider security in, uh, for, for virtual machine in, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the computing world. No? Now, some people like to ask us, you know, well, who supports using uh, Windows and Hyper-V inside of OpenStack? Well, these are some of the ones that support. Yeah. We've been working with uh, all major OpenStack uh, vendors from a, a platform perspective pretty much for the last four plus years. Um, you know, we've often been told, the, you know, pretty much if you look at the ecosystem, the Windows Guest is the only guest platform that's essentially supported by all those vendors, because in some cases they don't support each other. So uh, that leads me to believe that we've got one of the best supported guest platforms on top of any OpenStack distribution uh, today. So we as Cloudbase partner with all the names that you see there. So and, um, if, you, if you want to deploy and then Hyper-V nodes to an existing OpenStack deployment, it's, it's designed in a way in which you can just add the node and make it work, okay? Hyper-C. Hyper-C is a fully converged uh, um, uh, Windows Server and OpenStack powered cloud infrastructure. So we use the best things that come out of uh, Windows Server and the best thing that we develop upstream in OpenStack. No? So Nano Server 2016, uh, Storage Spaces Direct, uh, Scale Out File Server, Hyper-V, of course, Windows Failover Cluster, OpenV Switch, and so on. How many of you guys are running Hyper-V? I forgot to ask you. All right. Good. Very nice. Good. Thank you. So one thing that we did was to uh, port OpenV Switch um, on Windows. So OpenV Switch is, of course, let's call it the lingua franca for um, um, software-defined networking in, in OpenStack. 
and we knew that it was a uh, very difficult for Hyper-V and Windows Server to have a future in OpenStack without porting this. So we made an effort. We worked together up, upstream in the, in the OVS project with the folks at, at VMware and, 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 and the OVS community in general. And we are extremely happy about the results that, that came out from there. No? Um, great interoperability. Uh, it works. Uh, you can have a KVM and Hyper-V nodes in the same identical cloud. Uh, all tunneling supports, VXLAN, GRE, STT, Geneva, and so on. Uh, the same ML2 OVS agent that we have, and also very important, we support OVN, Open Daylight, NSX, and let's say every modern type of controller. So just to be clear, that's KVM, Hyper-V, side by side, without any extra, really, configuration on your part from a networking perspective, and delivering a 100% seamless, interoperable network uh, for your guests, right? Okay, demo time. So what you have here is a, is a fully hyper-converged OpenStack running, uh, running, running on top of these NUCs. So those are Intel NUCs here. We usually keep them at the boot, so this time we decided, hey, let's try to see if we can throw them on stage and, and make it work right away, <laughs> okay? And we encourage so, anybody who wants a closer look to move yeah, forward and move come forward, and take a peek. Take a picture. So, the idea is that those are four, four hyper-converged nodes, so you have compute, networking, storage, and everything on them, running, of course, Hyper-V, uh, storage spaces direct, uh, OpenV switch, and so on. They don't have IPMI because they are, as I was saying, they, they in the sixth generation Intel NUCs don't have, doesn't have a, an MTV Pro model. So what we have here is what you normally would do to uh, simulate uh, <laughs> IMI, IPMI uh, on a regular machine, which is uh, pressing a button and releasing a button. No? And since we didn't have any other simple way to do it, we used Lego with uh, EV3 Robotics and um, with a custom firmware, of course, and there are some motors under here that will simply press the button and uh, automate the full thing, okay? Then if you want to see more, you can come later at our booth to see it. There is a controller here that is running um, um, Ubuntu with Ubuntu Mass, which is performing the bare metal deployment of all the nodes and all the automated deployment of the entire OpenStack. So this simulates what normally happens in a real data center in which you have, uh, of course, your mass node. Um, uh, your mass controller deploying, of course, the entire nodes inside of the stack. So it's, you don't have to install anything managed. So if you think about the old school way of installing Windows Server in which you had to install Next, Next, and so on, Forget about it. It's everything entirely automated. Um, okay, I guess I can connect to it. Let me see if I find it. All right. So those are the Ubuntu mass nodes. So you can see those are the four uh, nooks, and the rest are a bunch of other machines running on, on the controller, okay? Uh, what else? Here I have my OpenStack. Let's see if I do a nova list. I should have everything. Yep. Now let's do some demos. Well, first thing I want to show you, I'm just RDPing into one of those machines, almost. I have no networking. Alex. Demo effects. See if we have them. Yes. So, if you guys are familiar with Windows Server Failover Cluster, this is actually where we have uh, um, the cluster manager just showing you that we are connected there. No? Now, and this is just one of the many compute nodes that we have. Many, four. <laughs> And I'm just RDPing into it, okay? Now, let's get back to the demo. Oh, 
other one. Just fetching a network which is called private VXLAN and just doing a Nova boot. Nova list. Okay, so I'm just watching my Nova list. Spawning. In a few seconds, it will be up and running. So, what's happening is that the scheduler choose one of those nodes, and all storage and compute, networking, and so on is handled there. No? A little bit of suspense. <laughs> Drum roll. In the meantime, what I can show you if I do here, I'm on a compute node, on, um, on one of the compute nodes, I just did a OVS VSC show exactly like you would do on any, uh, on any uh, let's say, Windows uh, Linux machine, and you can see all the flows and all the configurations that, that we have there, okay? So all the flows, sorry, all the, all the configure open with which configuration that we have, including all the tunnels and everything. Okay, machine is up and running. So I should be able to go here and you see that it's here. So the, what's happening here is that the normal compute driver coordinates with the cluster so that the cluster knows that the machine exists. Now, if I, okay, machine running. If I lie migrated, for example, well, before I migrated it, I'm, I'm assigning a floating IP. And I'm just RDPing into it from another node, from another, uh, sorry, from another shell. Okay. So you can see that the machine is here. And I, I can ping, you know? So I leave the ping running. So now this machine is running on uh, uh, the NUC number four. So if I go here, I do a get VM, I can see that the machine is running. No? And even here, it tells me in the cluster that it's on NUC number four. So I'm live migrating it to the first one. So now on the cluster, I should be able to see that the live migration started. And as you can see, the Nova driver is synchronizing with the cluster to tell it to go to the other side. And voila, it's running on the first one. So Nova show, it tells me that it's on VM1. As you can see, the ping didn't care. It's still running, you know? So this, all this happened automatically without any interruption for, for the user. Now let's see what's happening if something more brutal happens, like a full failover. So let's migrate it back to, to NUC04. And the next thing that we're going to do is to brutally shut down the node where it's actually is hosted. I think I misspelled the name. That's right. It's migrating. Uh, you changed NUC4 and now it's NUC4 is with capital. Oh. Okay. Now let's see where it's running. Okay, NUC1. Oh, 
Okay, I migrate into NOC4. I misspelled the name of the node, <laughs> so obviously it didn't migrate. Um, okay, it's on four, and now what I can do, so here it will tell me that it's active. I can go back on mass and tell mass to brutally power off that machine, okay? So it will talk to the, to the Lego nodes. Hear it? It's pressing the button, releasing the button now, and the machine is dead, you know? What's happening is you can see that the virtual machine already recognized that the, sorry, the cluster recognized that the node is dead, and the machine has been live migrated automatically on the other side. So me as a user, I'm able to, to simply reconnect to the machine and be able to access it, no? Because if I look at Nova list here, the machine is happening up and running on, on VM1, no? Here you go, NUC02. Here we go. If you want to see more of these things running, you can come to our booth and show them, okay? So this is a big advantage, meaning all your workloads will just work even if they, if they don't have an application level failover. They work just also if based on a host level failover. Okay. So essentially what we're getting at here is with Microsoft Technologies and OpenStack, we can uh, basically suit the needs of your pets and your cattle. Yeah. Okay, time to resume our slides. If you just want to see how uh, OpenStack works on Hyper-V, there is another open source project called Vimagine that uh, uh, runs on everything running Hyper-V. So even if you have a Windows 8, 8 1 or 10 um, laptop, it even runs, for example, on a Surface or anywhere, or just a Windows server, server running around, you can just run it and you will get uh, a one-node OpenStack fully functional on Hyper-V, okay? It's extremely simple to use. It's just like a next, next experience. So th the ideal thing for people having to learn how OpenStack works. So we also got a lot of mm -hmm. questions about the performance of Windows and OpenStack. And over the last two years, we've spent a significant amount of time ensuring that we can perform as well as Linux uh, in uh, an OpenStack ecosystem. What these uh, fancy colors and numbers show you are the results of the rally test that we did for an apples to apples comparison of both uh, KVM with Linux workloads as well as uh, Windows Server 2012 R2, as well as Windows Server 2016 with both Linux workloads. And uh, as you can see by the, just the nature of the colors, uh, Windows Server 2016 uh, basically slightly outperforms KVM uh, for Linux workloads uh, in an apples to apples Tempest comparison. There is a series of blog posts on uh, cloudbase.it where we explain how all this works. All the tests uh, have been performed with Rally, so uh, open source uh, classic OpenStack tools. The last ones are particularly interesting because they are based on, uh, on a Hadoop cluster, okay? So real enterprise workloads on, uh, on, uh, on this scenario. And what we're trying to show here is that, you know, Windows is a viable alternative as your hypervisor platform. Mm -hmm. Right, so if you have those licenses, there might be a reason to use it. Okay. Um, we already talked about the continuous integration, or you want to add something more now? Um, yeah, well, basically, you know, we have a, what is it, about 13 different uh, drivers that we currently test in our continuous integration today. Um, you know, we're on, uh, from an ongoing perspective, we're constantly uh, advancing that and adding new technologies to it as we uh, have time and have need to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our goal is to assure uh, that, you know, Windows is a viable alternative to Linux in your OpenStack ecosystem. So, and, and the best way we can do that is assure that we're as well tested um, as everything else. You know, I, I uh, would like it if you go and take a look for yourself on Stack of Linux, and you can easily look for the cloud-based solutions uh, under CI Boats and see how we uh, compare to the others, but I would guarantee you, you're going to be extremely surprised. So, from okay. that perspective. So what, what's coming next? I mean, uh, how do we plan to deploy um, Windows components uh, uh, going forward? Well, we like a lot the, the Color project, I think, which is brilliant. 
and uh, we are basically containerizing all the uh, all the Windows bits as well. So uh, Windows storage, uh, Windows compute, of course, as in Nova Compute, and um, networking for OBS uh, for for the Microsoft uh, uh, network controller stack and so on. Okay. So and and we will have a unified deploying model based on call. There are already patches which are currently in the process of being reviewed and merged uh, for an initial release, and then we will continue adding more. Okay. Um, there is also a blog post available to, to get an initial idea. Um, if you look at the modern type of uh, Windows workloads on OpenStack, Azure Service Fabric, uh, it's probably what you're looking for. It's working perfectly fine on OpenStack as well, fully automated, uh, including auto scaling and everything else. Docker uh, is, uh, of course, one of the big things that came with Windows Server 2016. And before, of course, on Windows 10 as well. And lots of people are containerized, containerizing their traditional applications and new applications in, in, the, in, the, in the Windows world. Think about um, ASP.NET and so on. So of course, we are going to help a lot in that direction as well on OpenStack and on Kubernetes. So um, at Google uh, Next, uh, there was, of course, a presentation uh, together with Aprenda uh, in which the Apprenda showed actually the, a, a full Kubernetes deploy using our uh, OpenStack, um, uh, sorry, our OpenV switch and OVN uh, model. Okay, so we are now in the process of making a CNI driver for that, and the, the, the preferred uh, networking model for um, um, Windows containers in, uh, in Kubernetes uh, will be, of course, OVN and OVS. We have a session about VDI, if you are curious, including a uh, an fully open source VDI project that's going to be tomorrow. Wednesday, thank you. Here we have actually a co-speaker. I have something like five or six sessions this time, so I completely messed up with the order. Um, OK, Peter, want to say so something for, about uh, this? You know, we get a lot of questions about OpenStack, Azure Stack, and SCV, and then and WAP. And you know, traditionally, those are really suited for different purposes. And you know, from where the work that we do here at OpenStack, we don't really see it as uh, competitive. Um, and you know, uh, and this is a quote from my employers: uh, Azure Stack and WAP have a different purpose, right? WAP is a great solution to build IaaS, and Azure Stack is great platform to run Azure services in your data center, right? And we look at OpenStack as being the solution if you want to have open source, uh, open cloud technologies and be able to consume Microsoft technologies alongside, right? So, um, you know, from that perspective, you know, OpenStack does bring the standard open source cloud IaaS APIs, right? And Azure Stack isn't uh, only about IaaS, but it brings the Azure services experience into your data center uh, and into, you know, your private cloud space. I think we can wrap up with one last slide. So again, this is not a comparison between apples and apples, okay? Those are really apples, oranges, and bananas. So don't think that you can put Azure Stack and OpenStack in the same comparison in a sentence, okay? Because they are completely different things, as Peter just said. Um, you get an idea of also the pricing model there. So um, Azure Stack will have a pay-as-you-go model based, of course, on Microsoft announcements, okay? The hardware will be quite hefty in order to deploy it, okay? So you have to consider the fact that uh, in order to have OpenStack deployments, at least based on what it's known publicly at the moment, um, and, and I put a bunch of links there about what we, the, the sources that are publicly available, not necessarily from Microsoft. So again, this is not, of course, a statement from Microsoft. Um, you will have to have a significant investment in hardware, while for OpenStack, you can start as small as you want. I mean, as you can see, you can have even a small proof of concept multi-node on just some simple nooks. Lots of people are asking about how does that compare also with the system center. And again, even here, there is no comparison. System center, at least how our customers typically see it, is more like as an alternative to VMware, okay? So not a real cloud alternative, not even with the web portal on top. So really, you have uh, three completely different spaces. Uh, one where OpenStack excels, one where Azure Stack excels, and one where System Center excels, okay? So we have customers, uh, and quite a lot, that are expecting to deploy both OpenStack and Azure Stack in the future. Of course, they can also communicate among each other, you can migrate VMs among them, okay? But most important, don't think that they are mutually exclusive. They are perfectly uh, valid uh, choices that you can have at the same time in your data center. I think we can wrap up here. 
So as we said earlier, if you have any questions for myself uh, and want to see it come from a Microsoft email address, feel free to email openstack at microsoft.com and you will get in touch with myself and the rest of our team. Okay. Um, and then for cloud-based yeah. solutions, feel yeah. free to reach out to uh, check their website or come see us at the booth for the rest of the week. Yeah, we are at the booth, of course, the cloud-based booth. And uh, there is also an ask.cloudbase.it where people usually ask questions related to our uh, product or uh, OpenStack involvement and, and everything. And of course, the upstream ask openstack.org. If it's anybody that. has uh, any questions and preference of time and to not step on anybody's toes, uh, we'd be more than happy to answer your questions on the floor later. Or, or now. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I got a question. Um, I'm an OpenStack newbie. We've had it for about a month, so a good portion of that time has been spent trying to get images mm -hmm. presented to the environment. Um, I've stumbled across the cloud-based tools, mm -hmm. and I've been able to successfully use them to create 2016 standard and nano images. Mm -hmm. Nice. Cool. But core is a totally different story. Um, I'm curious I, I, if you guys have support for core image generation on Windows online. Server Core, definitely. Uh -huh. that, that's what we do most of the time, actually. Yeah, I keep getting a boot res DLL error, but uh, okay. I'll follow up. Did you ask a question on ask uh, ask OK. No, I don't. I suggest you come down to the booth okay, come and we'll, to the booth we'll and have we will you have, uh, talk yeah. to an engineer. Okay. Okay. Thank awesome. you. Anybody else? Questions? Then we'll see you all uh, later and have a great week here in Boston. Okay. Thank you, guys. Good job, buddy.